you know, the writings that differ from each other. It's, it's one, and yet there's diversity within it. And we could look at that in terms of the seven, I think we tend to say seven genres. We could go down a level and look at all the different specific uh, uh, figures of speech or specific styles of writing. But if we go up above genres, we come to what we might call the broad uh, types of literature. And the three broad types are narrative, poetry, and discourse. So when you go through the Bible, you will be able to look at the page and uh, as long as you know what the difference is between these three, irrespective of where you are in the Bible, you'll look at the page and say, yeah, that's poetry or that's narrative or that's discourse. Discourse means kind of direct communication. So it could be a speech, it could be a letter, something kind of instructive, it's, it's direct communication. And so we've got these three broad types and everything in the Bible fits. Every page you're looking at fits under one of those categories. Narrative is the biggest, depending on, on how you measure it. Uh, I, I read one book that said narrative is 44% of the Bible. And then I read another one that said 67%. So somewhere between 44 and 67 uh, doesn't seem to be that accurate if you're getting that much distinction in your figures. Um, sounds like me doing my uh, accounts for the year. It's like, hang on a minute, this is completely different. But whichever number you take, narrative, there is a lot of it. And all the way through the Old Testament history, uh, which is a massive uh, selection, massive amount of books, a lot of the Gospels, Acts, we've got a lot of narrative. Even within the epistles, you'll get moments of narrative, uh, story being told, like Galatians 2 and Paul talks about uh, opposing Peter to his face. That's a narrative for about three or four verses. Uh, at the other end of the, the page there, we've got discourse. And discourse, that direct communication in the Old Testament would tend to be speeches or maybe law. And in the New Testament, of course, we've got the epistles, which is the, the majority of the discourse. That's actually the smallest of the three in terms of the total amount of scripture. Poetry is the one that sits in the middle. It's not as much poetry as there is narrative, but there's quite a bit more poetry than there is discourse. Okay, and so it's important that we uh, are aware of how the, the Jewish scriptures, the First Testament, uh, poetic writing functions. So that's what I'm going to try to do uh, in these few minutes. So the form of the text is inspired. I, I just kind of want to flag that for us. I, some people automatically get that and think that way. Some, some of us maybe have been raised in church traditions where we've got a very high view of scriptural truth, but maybe not quite so high a view of uh, scriptural artistry. That is to say, we, we're so quick to emphasize that this is God's word, this is true, and we, we derive our theology from it and we get our truth from it. But whether it's a psalm or whether it's a prophet or whether it's a gospel, doesn't really matter. It's all God's word. God's word says it, that settles it, you know, end of story. But what comes with that sometimes is a lack of awareness that actually there's, there's deliberate planning on God's part. He didn't just have a whole uh, vat of information that he wanted to give to us, and he didn't care what form it came in. He just kind of dumped it through the Bible writers. Now, actually, when he inspired them with what to say, he also inspired how they said it, which means that the fact that Psalm 23 is a poem and not a discourse is part of God's design. It's almost like God knew that it would be better for that truth to be communicated in that way than for it to come in a, an epistle from David to a, uh, an associate. Okay, so there, there's a deliberateness about the form in which the text is written. And so it's therefore good for us as we are uh, studying it to be aware, not just of kind of having our theological radar, you know, where we're looking for the truth to make sure that we're not a heretic. It's also good for us to have our literary radar on. What kind of literature are we looking at? What, what form is this in? Okay, I'm looking at a poem. Okay, what does that mean about how I should read it and make sense of it? 
So the form is inspired. And for us as preachers, that's a real blessing. The diversity of scripture means that if you're preaching from the whole Bible, there is built in diversity, built in variety. So you do not have to sound the same every single week, right? Now, most of us do sound fairly similar every time we preach. That's kind of our personality and, and so on. But if you maybe, I don't know, maybe you, you spot your, um, somebody in your church falling asleep. Maybe your spouse is falling asleep. That's always disappointing when you're preaching. And uh, maybe uh, she, she has an honest moment and says, um, it's kind of the same every week, you know. What do you do? Well, if you just recognize, uh, that wasn't me, I didn't write on there. Someone's got their pen out. Um, if you recognize that God has given us so much diversity, that means that as much as your sermon reflects the text, you are able to, to therefore preach with a variety in, in what you're saying because there's a variety there. No two passages are the same, but also different genres, different types are different from each other. Okay, so let's see here. Um, poetry. Okay, so where do we find Hebrew poetry? Obvious places, Psalms. Then, of course, the wisdom books, Job and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And then people start scratching their heads. Now, you, you're not going to scratch your heads because you know we're talking about prophets. But this is the one people forget. When you say there's, there's more poetry than discourse, you often get a kind of, serious? I, I didn't think Psalms was that long. And then you realize that actually the major prophets and the minor prophets are predominantly written in poetry not completely there are sections of discourse and sections of narrative but the vast majority is poetry hebrew poetry and so it's really going to be helpful for us to be thinking just uh, with an awareness of how hebrew poetry works so three introductory uh, study comments that or points i missed that word but then i went all prophetic and said even four just Felt like Amos, you know, it felt special to say that. So, poetic forms. What I'm saying there is, um, especially in the Psalms, you will tend to get uh, commentary saying this Psalm is an example of a corporate thanksgiving or a individual lament. And they'll give it a label. And then sometimes they'll say this varies from the form because it, kind of changes the order of these elements within it. And so it's almost giving the impression that there is a standard rule book for Hebrew poetic form, like what it should be. And I think sometimes we look at that because we have some certain specific rules for poetry in English, maybe in your language as well. There's certain kinds of poems you know, and so, for example, a, a common English type of poem begins, roses are red, violets are blue, and then it's going to say something else, and it's going to finish with the word you. All right, so typically for a sort of love letter, love note to, uh, from husband to wife, roses are red, violets are blue, they're very pretty, but not as pretty as you. We know the rules of that poem, right? And so when we read commentators saying, uh, this psalm doesn't fit the standard form of a lament. We assume there is a standard form of a lament, but the reality is there isn't. They're looking at a whole load of them and kind of evaluating and coming to the conclusion that this seems to be the standard shape, but then they're measuring specific poems against that and talking about the differences. And so you, once you realize there isn't a requirement for a poem to work a certain way, then you can really look at it on its own terms. I, I'm sure the same thing would apply in the prophets, that there are burdens or oracles, and there's a sort of a standard pattern, maybe, but there isn't a standard pattern that is more important than the actual text you're looking at. Okay, there's no kind of 
guidebook to writing an Old Testament prophet that Jeremiah had on his desk when he wrote his book first time or second time. Okay, so uh, we want to be aware of kind of standard patterns, but we don't want to force the text into standard patterns. We want to be aware of or beware of circular reasoning regarding historical setting. Again, Psalms, where there is a uh, historical comment at the top, this was when David pretended to be mad or this was when David committed adultery, then you know the, the setting for the content. But if you don't know that, which is the vast majority of Psalms, then you, you don't want to get into a situation where you're guessing when it was written and then reading it in light of that guess. And you'll find a similar kind of issue in the prophets where you know the history from the history books. You know that Isaiah wrote from 740 to 686 BC in the reign of these four kings. But you can't always pinpoint a specific section as being specifically in this time frame. Jeremiah is notoriously difficult because it kind of jumps backwards and forwards. And so if you're reading that and you say, well, I think this was when such and such happened. And then you say, well, because such and such happened, it means this. That's circular reasoning. And we want to let the text give us the information that it gives us, but not force it to make sense based on guesswork. OK, so that's going to be one of the challenges for us. Number three, don't dissect poetry and drain the emotion. That means don't cut it up so that you've got precise study of detail, but you've lost the life and the force of it. So nothing worse than analyzing a poem and losing the emotional impact of it. We can analyze it, but we've got to be careful not to lose that, that sense of what it's intending to accomplish. And number four, recognize the basic building block, which is parallelism. OK, we'll come back to that in a second. And that's going to be what we focus on. But thinking about preaching for a second, two introductory preaching notes. So when we're preaching poetry, we want to study the structure, the imagery, the detail of a poem long enough to really feel its force. OK, so sometimes you can look at a poem and you can understand it, but you haven't felt it yet. So, for example, in, in the Hebrews uh, chapter two that, that I just was preaching. At least it feels like I was just preaching it, but you know what I mean? Um, in Hebrews two, he quotes from Psalm eight. All right. So Psalm eight, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And he goes on and he talks about uh, the birds of the air, the fish of the seas, all that swim the paths of the seas and so on. There's a whole load of stuff in that Psalm that we are really familiar with right? We know what stars are. We know what the moon is. We know, um, we know the heavens exist. But we live in the 21st century with electricity, right? We, as soon as the sun goes down, the lights go on, which means that we may be experts in watching television, but we're not experts at staring at the, uh, the sky at night, right? Unless you're into astronomy, you don't tend to lie out in a field every night and recognize the stars and the patterns and, you know, the, the kind of what's where at what time of year and all that kind of stuff. For most of us, that is not our experience anymore. And so if we read Psalm 8, we can say, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, we can go, yep, I get that. But actually, when you slow down and think about it and ponder it, then you can start to feel what it must have been like to really ponder the sky. Like for David as a young shepherd, for example, 12 hours every night, aware, listening for threats to the sheep, but with the sky as his companion. That makes it a very different thing for him than it is for us. And so we want to make sure that in the way that we're studying, we're feeling the force of the poetry. We'll see the same thing multiple times in the prophets, that there is a power to it that sometimes is removed from where we are, kind of because of historical distance. 
And therefore, once we've studied that, we can then hopefully preach poetry, whether it's Psalms or wisdom or prophets, preach it so that listeners feel the force of it. Okay, so it's not just uh, my job as a preacher to educate. It's much better than that, much richer than that. I don't simply want to download information to my listeners. I want to preach it so that I'm not just saying what it says, but I'm doing what it does. So if that poem is designed to, to stir people to awe, my preaching should stir people to awe. If that poem is designed to bring great conviction, relying on God, I need to preach in such a way that it can bring great conviction. Not just, okay, I understand that, it's quite convicting. No, no, I want you to feel the force of it. So, parallelism. Here's a really basic introduction uh, to this. I've got a book that I was, a uh, spelling mistake, I apologize. Uh, I was tempted to uh, pull out and look at. It's about 150 pages, all on parallelism. I'm sure Andy reads it every night from uh, Adele Berlin. But it's, uh, for our purposes, I'm going to keep this really basic, really straightforward. So parallelism is where you're building poetry using at least two lines that are connected. Sometimes you'll get, uh, typically you'll get two lines, sometimes three, sometimes four, sometimes seven, very rarely. But essentially, two is the standard. And so that's what these examples are going to give to us. And the relationship between the first line and the second line is important for us to recognize so that we can feel how the two lines together accomplish their, their goal. Okay, so the first example is the easiest kind to spot, antithetical parallelism. The second line contrasts with the first. So look at that verse there from Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. The reason I say it's easy to spot antithetical is because the second line begins with but. So there's an obvious contrast. Sometimes it doesn't and it's more difficult. The vast majority, in English at least, is very, very obvious. Line one is saying something, but line two is saying something contrasting to it. So it's this opposite kind of a feel. And you hold the two together to feel the point. The first line is set, setting up the second line. What you don't want to do is just pluck out one line and ignore the other one. So if you were to take this and say, I'm going to preach about many of the afflictions of the righteous, and then you spend the next 30 minutes listing the afflictions of the righteous, and then you close in prayer, that is a pretty depressing sermon but it's also not particularly biblical. It's not biblical to just have a whole list of afflictions if you're using this as your text, because the second line clarifies what's intended. Okay, the second one here, we've got synonymous parallelism. The Y should be before the M there, apologies. So the second line is reinforcing the first. So instead of coming in contrast, the second line is, is kind of coming through so it almost feels like the same thing but never a uh, strict repetition so psalm 49 verse 3 my mouth shall speak wisdom the meditation of my heart shall be understanding so it's not contrasting speaking and thinking it's reinforcing that what's going on inside me what's coming out and what's behind it is dwelling on wisdom understanding there's the connection between the two lines and the second line isn't a simple repetition it's building on but it's or it's, it's modifying or qualifying but it's essentially saying the same thing okay so that's what we would call a synonymous parallelism i want to show you two more types and then i'm going to get you into groups to look at a few lines from uh from a prophet Okay, synthetic parallelism is not simply synonymous. It's much more of a building exercise. So the second line is building on, developing, going further with the first line. So you could argue that my example from uh, synonymous was synthetic. Some people would say, oh, I'm not sure that feels a bit synthetic rather than synonymous. It's not an argument to have it's just helpful to recognize to force us to think about what's going on 
So why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Why is that synthetic? Because it, times of trouble is very vague. Times of trouble is, there's lots of types, but specifically, and so you could sort of say, okay, here's the first line. The second line is, is almost cutting into it to, to kind of narrow the focus in this case. You see, the second line is, is adding to building on the first. And then I, I, I use this one as a fourth. Typically, the first three are the ones that I would teach. But I decided to add this, this fourth one because it's quite common. There's actually a whole load. You could come up with a list of about 20 types of parallelism. Uh, and they're all typically variations on the synthetic approach. But emblematic parallelism is where there's a connection through simile or metaphor. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. That's a simile. There's a like in there. Okay, so don't worry so much about that one, but you'll see that actually there's quite a lot because that's how the imagery is going to come through.